beg to move that this House do now adjourn. Yeah, yeah. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Peter Grant. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak briefly tonight on the plight of innocent civilians in Gaza, although it breaks my heart that this debate is necessary. About 1.8 million people are trapped in Gaza right now. Almost all of them are internal refugees, multiple internal refugees. They haven't only been forced to flee their homes elsewhere in Gaza, but most of them have had to flee several times mm. as places that they were promised would be safe soon became anything but. I don't want to go into the arguments about the legality or illegality or the morality or immorality of what's happening in Gaza and what's happened previously in Israel. Those are debates that, of course, have to continue. But I want to use this opportunity to, to ask what steps the UK government is doing, what it is taking, to save the lives of people who are in mortal danger. And I'm going to suggest, to nobody's surprise, that the government are not doing nearly enough. We've already seen over 27,000 deaths in Gaza. Most of those deaths have been women and children. The vast, vast, vast majority of them have been completely innocent civilians who have never wished any harm on anyone. And there is a real and imminent danger that that horrific death toll will increase exponentially exponentially if, as still seems quite likely, UNWRA is forced to either stop or significantly scale down its life-saving work in Gaza. People are already dying, not just through military action, but because essential supplies of food, water, medicines are not getting through in sufficient quantities. Is Honourable Friend, the great was the Honourable Friend for giving away his making. Uh, you know, a powerful start to his speech. He mentions these people who are innocent civilians who are being uh, subjected to these horrendous conditions. My constituent, Dr. <coughs> Salim Gayada, has 40 family members uh, who are living uh, day by day trying to avoid the horrendous circumstances that, uh, and death and everything else that people have to put up with there. Isn't it about time that the UK government put a scheme in even if it is for the relatives of UK citizens to actually come and get safe harbour away from the, the atrocities that they face every day. I yeah, absolutely agree with my honourable friend, and I will come on to that later in my speech. I know that his constituent, and indeed um, many of our constituents, um, have hardly slept for four months because they never know yeah. when they're going to get the phone call, not only about the death of one relative, but in some cases the deaths of five, 10, 15 relatives at the, the same time. It's an unimaginable and worry for people to be living to, to be living with. I would always give you yeah. to the gentleman. <laughs> Can I commend the Honourable Deputy for uh, Glenn Ross for bringing this forward, and it is something that we all have in our mind. Do, does the Honourable Member not agree that the most vulnerable under attack in Gaza need a clear path to safety? And would the Honourable Member join me in urging the neighbouring na nations to also step up their efforts to welcome refugees with open arms? And, aid. and does the Honourable Member further agree that our government should be ensuring that we are doing all we can to help with ensuring that aid gets to the people that very clearly need it most? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. There is nothing the Honourable Gentleman has said there that I would disagree with. Um, I would point out that some of the neighbouring countries have got between one and two million refugees mm -hmm. from places like Syria um, hosted by them just now. That is why it is a global problem. The whole world has got to be prepared yeah. to take action on that. Um, as I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll give you once more, and then I do need to make some progress. I'm really grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for securing this debate. I have a constituent who is a Palestinian stu international student at university in York. His family remain in Gaza, and he is desperate for his children to join him, and yet government haven't opened up the opportunity for a scheme to bring his family to him. Would he not agree that it would be the humanitarian thing for this government to do is to open up those opportunities, those visa opportunities, for families to be reunited? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I, I think the, the message that we're getting is that this is something that's affecting significant numbers of people uh, in the United Kingdom. There's a large number of our constituents who have got close family members who are in desperate mortal danger, and we simply cannot stand by uh, and then wonder how some of them did not survive. I have already mentioned, Mr Deputy Speaker, that um, lives are being lost because the aid is not always getting through in time, and it is certainly not getting through in sufficient quantities. If UNWRA have to significantly scale down or even stop their activities, the situation is going to become unimaginably worse. 
You might think that 250 deaths every day is bad enough. It could get um, significantly worse than that. I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that if we don't start to act soon, we could see more civilian deaths in Gaza than there were in Rwanda in 1994. Yeah. Gaza could become the new Rwanda. And regardless of what terminology different people choose to use to describe the actions of the various warring factions in and around Palestine just now, regardless of the terminology we use to describe what has been done to the innocent civilians, regardless of who we choose to point the finger of blame at, it's not tenable for us to suggest that we just stand back and wait for today's figure of tens of thousands of preventable deaths to grow into hundreds of thousands or even worse. And part of the response has got to be to get people out of harm's way as quickly as possible and in as large numbers as possible. What I'm asking the government to do as a first step is something that I know for a fact other countries have already done. So let's not pretend it's something that the government can't do. Initially, further civilians in Gaza with close family members in the United Kingdom, the UK government should at the very least be negotiating the safe passage for them to get out of Gaza, mm -hmm. and secondly, guaranteeing them the right to come to the United Kingdom and yeah, join yeah. the families. Not necessarily as a permanent step, because that's not what the Palestinians want, but yeah. to keep them safe until their homeland, the land they want to return to, mm -hmm. is once more safe and fit for human habitation. A short-term emergency measure. It's not palatable, yeah, yeah. as to some in the government benches, I appreciate that. The alternative is far, far less palatable. I have previously referred in this chamber on a number of occasions to my constituent, Dr Lubna Hadoura. She came as a student, like the Honourable Lady's constituent she mentioned earlier on, but she liked Scotland so much that she stayed. She has given over 30 years of her life, an entire lifetime of service to our NHS as a consultant surgeon, most of it in Fife. She has probably saved the lives of a lot of my constituents. She has got about 20 close relatives living under the bombardment in Gaza, ranging from her elderly mum to two babies who are too wee even to walk. Dr Hadoura loves living in Fife. Most of her family have no intention of coming to live permanently in Fife or indeed anywhere else in the United Kingdom. They want to live their lives in Palestine. That is home for them. Yeah, yeah. But most importantly of all, yeah, yeah. they want to live. Mm -hmm. And living is becoming almost physically impossible yeah, yeah. in Gaza well just now. Well now I can make a particular appeal given Dr Hadoura's outstanding contribution to her adopted country, the Or, and I think getting even her mum out to safety is only a fraction of the debt that we all, all owe to her. I know most members here um, are already making similar appeals for their constituents' families. Personally, and it is only a personal view, I don't think we should be stopping at just helping families, but people with families in the UK. Because I don't think we should knowingly leave anyone yeah. to die. Here, here. But sadly, On that point, sadly <coughs> I hold up little hope of the government being willing to go as far as that today. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for giving way, and I wanted to add my voice because, as he knows, the constituent who he has mentioned has a sister yeah. who is my constituent and is also yeah. someone who's, been, who's given many years' service to the NHS. And, of course, that family are in a position to financially support any relatives that came from Gaza to the UK temporarily. But of course, can I just also say that I, I agree with him, as well as families like our constituents, we should also have a wider humanitarian visa. Now, in the last few months, we've had nearly twice as many civilian deaths in Gaza as have happened in Ukraine. What is it, does he think, that's different between the position of the Gazans and the Ukraine, Ukrainians that's preventing the British government from issuing a humanitarian visa? I can only speculate as to what the government's thinking might be. I can see no distinction whatsoever. I refuse to accept any distinction between any two human beings who are in mortal danger. We don't expect firefighters to check bank accounts or passports before they decide who's going to be taken out of the burning building. Yes, yes, we well don't said. expect ambulance crews to check who somebody is before they decide which order to treat the casualties of a road accident. We certainly, although some people do, we certainly wouldn't expect to see the heroes who man and women our lifeboats stopping to check someone's identity before they decide whether they're going to pull them out of the sea. In the same way, we shouldn't be making distinctions as to who should be allowed to live in the United Kingdom and who should be left to die in Gaza or anywhere else. As I said, sadly, I don't think we're going to see that amount of movement from the government today or any time at all. In fact, 
So far, the government has refused even to meet me, to listen to the moral and humanitarian imperative case, to let Dr Hadoura's elderly mum survive, to let the rest of her family survive, and to let as many of those 1.8 million people as possible survive. The most recent reply I got from the Foreign Office, it was very sympathetic, it was very apologetic, and it was utterly, utterly dismissal, dismissive. It would, it would be easy to look at that letter and think it was written by somebody who genuinely could not have cared less about the plight of Palestinians right now. And I don't think that is a correct description of anyone in the Foreign Office, that that is the impression that they have given to my constituent with the letter that they sent. I, I thank the Honourable Member for, for giving way, and I, this is a very important uh, debate that he's leading. I thank him. Um, and and I, I similarly have issues with uh, several constituents. And I, I guess I'm surprised there don't seem to be that many people. I think there are three who've written to me. So I don't think it's a huge number that the government should be concerned by. But these are people who are you know, family members contributing to the UK economy. And these are family members, in my cases with Rami uh, Al-Fakawi and al Safi, who have lost 52 members of their family or the member needs urgent medical intervention. And that's why we should do the humanitarian right thing for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the Honourable Member is absolutely right. We're talking about doing the humanitarianly right thing. But what is the, yeah. the right thing Human. to do? Um, and I would suggest that the situation in Gaza has become so critically desperate that the humanitarian response is the only one that can be morally tenable for any of us. I said that the letter for the Foreign Office was dismissive. And I'm sorry to have to say it was less than 100% honest mm -hmm. because it kept talking in a space of a one and a half page letter Eight times it talked about what they could do, what they couldn't do, what they were able to do, what they weren't able to do. So let me say once again to the Minister, I'm not asking the UK Government to do anything that it can't do. I'm not asking the UK Government to do anything that I know other countries, that other than that, that I know other countries, including some of our closest international allies, that they have already done for the families of their citizens to get them out of Gaza. So for the Foreign Office, it's not a question of we can't do anything more. It's a question of we choose not to do anything more. Yeah. And I think yeah, that yeah. is an untenable yeah. position for anyone sure. to adopt yeah. just now. Uh, he's making some excellent points, and I share his frustrations also having written to um, the Foreign Secretary on this issue on behalf of my constituent, Sama, whose family has been evacuated six times and who, the IDF bombardment recently destroyed the family home, which took them 30 years to build. Would he agree with me that there needs to be some route for those uh, families in that situation? Because at the moment, Sama has no answers from this government and there is no way of getting her family to safety. Yes, again, I agree entirely with my honourable friend's comments. And one thing that is important, and one thing that is causing immeasurable upset to my constituent, Dr Hadoura, and to a great many other Palestinians in the United Kingdom, is that they are in contact with Palestinian families in other countries, and they are seeing them getting their loved ones out yep. of yeah. Palestine. And they know that when the UK government say we can't do anything about it, other countries' governments have been able to do it. They maybe have reasons for not wanting to publicise it, and they maybe have reasons for not wanting it to be too widely known, but they are willing to go beyond the legal minimum in order to get people out and reunited with their families. The, letter I got from, the last letter I got from the, the Foreign Office Minister finished by saying, I recognise this will be disappointing news. Disappointing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Disappointing. I wanted to relay it to you as soon as possible so that your constituent can take informed decisions about his family's next step. Incidentally, it was clear in the letter that Dr. Yeah. Hadoura is a she, not a he. Um, that made me convinced that that's a cut and paste job from another letter, and they hadn't yeah. even bothered Shocking. to make it ta tailored to the individual constituent I had written about. Relaying it to me as soon as possible was in a letter that was sent two months after I had contacted the minister. By contrast, on Friday last week, within the space of about two hours, I had two emails and two phone calls. Well, my office had two emails and two phone mm -hmm. calls from the Foreign Office wanting to know what the tonight's debate was about. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us about yep. where their priorities are? Yep. But it was more urgent to sort out which minister will respond to the debate than it is to agree to meet members of Parliament to try and find a way, let's not forget, to try and find a way of stopping people from dying unnecessarily. But it's a bit after that that I just found callous beyond belief. 
so that my constituent, Dr Hadoura, can take informed decisions about her family's next steps. Precisely what decisions are available mm -hmm. to Dr Hadoura, yeah. yep. to her family and to the 1.8 million others? What on earth are they supposed to decide about? There are no options. There is no survival plan for those families in Gaza because it is becoming impossible for anyone to survive in Gaza. An earlier government response suggested they should all apply for visas to travel to the United Kingdom. Well, really, great idea. It's impossible for them to apply mm -hmm. to, for a visa from Gaza. Where are they going to apply to? Yeah. Who's got a consulate that's still operating in Gaza? If they try to travel somewhere else in Gaza to get a visa, there's a very high risk that they'll be shot. If by some miracle they manage to reach the Egyptian border, because remember the only borders they've got are with Israel and Egypt, if by some miracle they reach the Egyptian border, the border guards will say, have you got a visa to travel on somewhere else? No, get back to Gaza then. And the whole thing goes round in a circle. They can't get a visa without getting out of Gaza, and they can't get out of Gaza without a visa. The government understands that. The government fully understands that and are not prepared to issue visas from here, which, as has been mentioned, they're done uh, for fleeing people uh, from other parts of the world. Dr Hadoura's own the family's only chance, the only chance for any of those 1.8 million people, is that they're taken under the protection of another government, as some have been. Some have been taken out under the protection of other governments. They need there to be a government that will negotiate safe passage for them out of Gaza. They need a government that will give them safe refuge until it's safe for them to go back home where they want to live out their lives. They need a government that cares, not only with its words, but with its actions. They need a government that can look at this human catastrophe yeah. with the eyes and heart of a human being. Within the next 15 minutes or so, Mr Speaker, we will know whether that description can be applied to this, to this government. Yeah. Yeah. Minister, Leah Doherty. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for Glenn Rothers for securing this debate uh, and uh, for his thoughtful contributions. And of course, uh, the Minister of State uh, uh, cannot be here. He's attending to other duties, but I'm very uh, pleased to be able to answer uh, on his behalf. And I will try to uh, cover off the points raised. And of course, I should say, uh, when it comes to matters of correspondence, we will ensure that. Uh, uh, the Honourable Gentleman uh, it, it receives uh, uh, timely and accurate uh, replies uh, pursuant to that specific case, and I shall uh, work with officials to make sure that, uh, that, that, that those responses are in good order. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, of course, uh, I think everyone across the House uh, can agree that the situation in Gaza is desperate. Innocent Palestinians are suffering uh, terribly amid the uh, growing and very substantial humanitarian crisis. The death toll, as was mentioned, has now topped uh, in excess of 27,000, with more than 66,000 reported injured, mostly women and children. Fewer than half of Gaza's hospitals are even partially functional, and they lack the staff, equipment and uh, resources they need. Meanwhile, large numbers of people are living in overcrowded uh, shelters without the most basic amenities and suffering unthinkable trauma uh, from the near constant bombardment. More than 1.7 million have fled their homes, with nearly half of Gaza's population packed into the southern region of Rafah. Um, my honourable friend asked what the United Kingdom was doing in response to this, and he indicated that uh, his, it was his view that we weren't doing enough. But of course, there are several different aspects to this response, and I'll turn to them each uh, in turn. Uh, he asked uh, about this, the, those seeking to flee Gaza. And uh, to answer his question very directly, uh, at this time we are not considering a bespoke route for uh, Palestinians affected by the conflict. Moreover, the, the issue of resettling Palestinian refugees is, of course, complicated by uh, a specific question that we must very carefully consider, which is the, the right of the return, the right of return, which is uh, an issue at the heart of uh, the Middle East peace process. For many of those fleeing Gaza, the permanent uh, re resettlement to a third country is not the right uh, solution. And indeed, it may be the worst option for those whose dearest hope is to live out their days in a recognised state of Palestine. Of course, in the, we, if we, it, it, the, the House will know that we are a generous nation. Half a million, half a million people 
uh, have been offered uh, 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 place in this country uh, via a safe and legal route uh, when fleeing danger since uh, 2015. Uh, but uh, a bespoke route is not the right solution for this current situation. Delighted to give away. I, I think my honourable friend was very clear that what he was looking for was temporary visas. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, as the Minister said, Palestinians will want to return when and if it's safe for them <coughs> to do so. But doesn't he think that the United Kingdom has a particularly respons particular responsibility here, given the history of our involvement in the region and mm -hmm. the Balfour Declaration? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we all have a responsibility, all developed nations have a responsibility to ensure that we, ha we have a responsibility to ensure uh, the humanitarian, the urgent humanitarian disaster in Gaza is, is made less severe uh, by our interventions, and that's what we're doing. Uh, right now it is clear that we need measures to increase the provision of uh, humanitarian aid, uh, helping those uh, in desperate need. And the government is therefore focused on these efforts uh, alongside our efforts to achieve a sustainable ceasefire. That is, the, that is the way that we will help those suffering in Gaza. And we will use that. I, I believe this gentleman was delighted to give away. No, for a sustainable ceasefire, at what point does this government actually call for a ceasefire? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, we, I, will, I will come to that, and we, do, we, we have called for a humanitarian pause and a sustainable ceasefire, a sustainable ceasefire, and I will remark on what that means uh, presently, but if I can just make clear to the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, colleagues should be aware that we have trebled our aid uh, to the occupied Palestinian territory since uh, October the 7th, uh, committing £60 million this financial year. Uh, this supports crucial partners like the British Red Cross, the UN and Egyptian Red Crescent Society help to help civilians with food, fuel, water, health care and shelter. Delighted to give away. He may be saying, he's saying that um, aid provision is there, but aid provision is simply not getting through. And I attended a briefing by ActionAid, among others, this morning that said, for example, dignity packs for women are stuck in a warehouse and not getting over the border. Meanwhile, women are having to menstruate into bits of tent. Does he think that is acceptable? Well, no, we are not satisfied that enough aid is getting through, and we are working uh, uh, very energetically uh, in terms of our diplomatic efforts to increase uh, the flow of uh, aid. Uh, we need to see water, fuel and electricity restored. We want to see the Eretz crossing uh, open to allow direct aid. Uh, to the north of Gaza. We want to see Ashdod port opened. We want to see unencumbered access to aid coming from Jordan. Uh, we, want to, we want the Kerem Shalom uh, uh, crossing open seven days a week rather than just five days a week. Uh, we want to extend the opening hours and capacity of the Nitzana screening facility and, and the Kerem Shalom checkpoint so that more, uh, a greater volume of aid can pass via trucks. Uh, we want to ensure the UN has the people, vehicles and equipment necessary. Uh, and uh, Part of that uh, increased flow of aid, we hope, is, is a humanitarian pause, and that is something we are expending a huge amount of diplomatic effort on, uh, uh, p pushing for, and of course the, the Minister for the Middle East is travelling in the region pursuant to that this week, and the Foreign Secretary will be doing the same uh, in the coming weeks. Delighted. Uh, I'm grateful to the Minister giving way, and returning to the point in question, my constituent is here under the British Council Scholarship Scheme. He has two tiny children in Gaza and his wife. He couldn't afford to bring them over here on a visa. He's a student studying at the um, British Council's request, and he wants to be reunited with his children, his little children, who have seen many of their friends and family killed. Why won't the government reach out to that family and allow them safe passage to be reunited together? Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, safe and legal routes do exist, and if there is a case with that, with, if the, if the, which, 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 which describes elegantly the limits that describes, I think her question describes elegantly the limits of the government's executive capacity. Of course, where, where safe and legal, you know, safe and legal routes do exist, but the way of us, the, the way we can have a positive impact to set the conditions for people like her, the, 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 the people she mentioned, is for us to push for a 
humanitarian ceasefire. Uh, to, to push for a, for, to, for a humanitarian pause and a ceasefire. It's irresponsible uh, to talk in hypotheticals otherwise. The way that the situation will be improved is for us to achieve a humanitarian pause. And uh, for, for us to make rhetorical statements that do not pertain to reality would be simply irresponsible, Mr Deputy Speaker. Now, I should point out to the House that... No, I wait. I must make some progress. During his uh, visit to Al Arish uh, in Egypt, uh, the Foreign Secretary met with representatives from the Egyptian Red Crescent Society, uh, who are coordinating the relief effort at the Rafa crossing. Uh, and we heard how the UK's uh, contributions of shelter, blankets, and other vital equipment has been providing much needed relief to the people of Gaza. Uh, but of course, we also heard about the many constraints to uh, the humanitarian operations that we, we face. And that's why it is our judgment that Israel must take steps, working with partners, including the UN and Egypt, to significantly increase the flow of aid. Uh, this includes allowing prolonged humanitarian pauses, opening more routes into Gaza, and restoring water, fuel, and electricity. The Foreign Secretary is directly engaging with Israeli leaders on this and has announced uh, work alongside Qatar to get more aid into Gaza, uh, with our joint consignment containing 17 tonnes of tents being flown in last Thursday. When he met with Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu at the end of January, he reiterated the need for Israel to open more crossing points for Nitzana and Kerem Shalom to be open for longer, and for Israel to support the UN to distribute aid effectively across the whole of Gaza. We, we are... Yes, I will. We are, we are also continuing our work uh, with, with Egypt on steps to increase uh, human humanitarian ac access via the Rafa crossing. Delighted to work. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving me. Can I take him back to his comment about safe and legal routes? Mm. Nobody can cross from Gaza to Egypt unless there are documents that prove they have been given the right to enter a third country. Okay. Nobody in Gaza has any way of getting such documents. Could the Minister just describe exactly where the safe and legal route, route is and how Gazans are supposed to get there? Yeah. The only way that anyone will be able to come to safety is if there is a humanitarian pause and a sustainable ceasefire. So if government ministers making statements about how many people we, we may or may not take would be rhetorically impressive but practically meaningless, this is Deputy Speaker. And therefore we are, we are focused on, this, on the purposeful work and serious diplomacy of pushing for a humanitarian pause and then a sustainable ceasefire. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government wants to see an end to the fighting as soon as possible. Uh, the Foreign Secretary has worked tirelessly across the Middle East to push for a humanitarian pause and a sustainable ceasefire. Two weeks ago, he travelled to Israel, the occupied Palestinian territories, Qatar and Turkey, and last week he visited Oman, Saudi Arabia and Lebanon. Face-to-face -face talks with leaders like Benjamin Netanyahu, Mahmoud Abbas and Mohammed bin Salman are invaluable in setting out UK views and understanding uh, the position of countries who Order. can help to end this conflict. I beg to move to this House to now adjourn. The question is this House to now adjourn. Minister. As the Foreign Secretary has set out, we want to see an immediate pause in the fighting to allow vital aid into Gaza and to give space for a deal that would get the hostages out. We are also working to turn what would be a fragile truce into a sustainable permanent ceasefire without a return to more fighting. This means giving Israel the reassurance that it needs to end its campaign. This means the Hamas leaders must leave Gaza and the attacks on Israel uh, against Israel uh, must end. All Israeli hostages must be released and a new Palestinian government formed that can deliver for all its citizens, accompanied by an international support package. It also means giving the people of Gaza and the West Bank the political perspective of a Palestinian state and a new future. Now, turning to reconstruction efforts, while the long-term future of a Palestinian state is important for a lasting peace, there is uh, the immediate task of rebuilding Gaza. Mr Deputy Speaker, we should be in no doubt that reconstruction will be a daunting task. It will take a giant international effort because of the scale of destruction. And it's beyond the means of any one country and a wide coalition of Western countries, Arab and Muslim states, as well as Israel and the Palestinians will be needed. Gaza will need as many people as possible to join the effort. Binding, uh, building this support is another of the Foreign Secretary's diplomatic objectives. 
So we, Mr. Deputy Speaker, push, will continue to push for uh, a humanitarian pause on a sustainable ceasefire. We recognise we recognise the unthinkable. Delighted to give way. I'm really grateful because I want to return the minister to the subject of this evening's debate and the desperate situation that my constituents' children find themselves in. They cannot come to the UK unless the UK government give them that right to come here. The UK government is not giving them that right and therefore when will the minister allow those children to be reunited with their father together with their mother here in the UK? Mr Deputy Speaker, we, we are seeking to improve the humanitarian situation, including those, uh, of those individuals she, she refers to, by ensuring there's a de-escalation, uh, a pause in the fighting and a sustainable ceasefire. That is the way we will attend to the desperate situation uh, that affects more than those two uh, individuals she mentioned. That is our serious purpose. Uh, our commitment is, is, is uh, beyond doubt, both in resource and diplomatic effort. And that is, that is the purposeful and sincere effort of the Foreign Secretary and the entire department. And our focus is, uh, immediately is on getting more aid in, securing an immediate pause in the fighting. That is how those affected will uh, have their lives improved. And we must do all we can, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to generate momentum to build a permanent peace and to rebuild Gaza. Thank you. The question is that this House to stand adjourned. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Ayes have it. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.